God damn it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Face the Truth. Um, I'm re-recording an intro for this uh, podcast. Um, Why am I doing that? Because I was so nervous. This is one of the first times I've ever felt nervous um, interviewing someone or talking to someone on my podcast. And to be honest, I was so mad at myself um, throughout most of the talk because I was just like, why am I so nervous? You know, and my, my mouth kept getting dry, and it's not like me to be this way. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing, but I'm just being open and honest and straight up with y'all. Um, I was nervous. Why was I nervous? Because I was talking to the freaking drummer of the Black Keys, which <laughs> is one of my favorite bands of all time. I've been a fan for almost 20 years, and um, I was so excited to be able to talk to him and uh, so happy that he took the time to talk to me. Um, and what can I say? I'm human. Um, it's, it's not that bad. I just was like, oh, I, uh, I didn't like it. So that's why I'm, I'm redoing an intro here. And I just wanted to be straight up with everybody um, that, yeah, uh, I was nervous. Um, but it was a great talk. I hope you all enjoy it. Um, he's such an awesome guy, super nice, uh, very funny, has great stories. And what I really um, appreciated about this talk, and I think you'll, you'll get this out of it, is that he's just so open and honest and so real and humble. Um, he's gotten to the, <laughs> the highest place that a musician can, can basically get to. And he's still um, just such a down-to-earth, um, very humble and honest person. And I really appreciated his, his openness and his honesty. Um, so not only is he the drummer for the Black Keys, um, he's also uh, an amazing and accomplished uh, music producer. He's produced so many different albums that are just amazing. So many awesome bands. Um, also a songwriter. And just overall really, really cool guy. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoy this. Without further ado, Patrick Carney. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for this, man. This, is, uh, yeah. this has been something that I've been wanting to do for a while. I did this whole podcast basically just so I could talk with you this this whole thing so all right yeah <laughs> it's all about you man <laughs> um no but there was you know I was trying to think of what I wanted to talk to you about because I've listened to a lot I've been a fan of your music for a long time and I've listened to a lot of the uh interviews and I kind of you've, you've been asked every single thing <laughs> over and over and over again a lot of the interviews the exact same questions over and over and over again um and then especially when you guys took your break came back there was all this drama oh they must hate each other and then you guys had the same interviews it's it's, it's it was you know, i kind of felt annoyed just listening to them yeah. um so what i want to talk to you about because it's like everything's already been out there is i really you know the whole reason i do this anyways is, is about art and um i'm curious about you from your perspective um at the level that you guys have gone or gotten to uh the, the art of your music and producing and everything, um, you know, and, and how much it's really changed since when you first started back in like what, 2002 or one or something like that. We, yeah. We started 2001. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of, uh, visual art music. Um, and I think they go, you know, they go kind of hand in hand, uh, but the weird thing is, is uh, like our music. I mean, and you've probably like since you've read interviews and things. Like I'm going to be repeating myself, but I, but I'm just going to assume that whoever's listening has it. But our band's like um, intrinsically like kind of rooted in in a type of art, sort of uh, like the for instance, like, like our band name comes from an artist. Uh, an outsider artist from Akron. His name is Alfred McMoore. And um, this guy, uh, you know, he was schizophrenic. He had a learning disability. He had a plethora of, of issues. He lived in a, 
assisted living kind of co-op. Um, the, over the years, we've ended up like kind of it was it's like our main charity that we support when we when we do stuff like that. Um, but anyway, Alfred, uh, he's African American. Um, he he lived in uh, South Akron, and uh, he was a complete genius, like a savant, really. Um, but he would do these incredible drawings with crayon and pencil, um, and he would do do mostly these scroll paintings, what we call them. They're five feet wide. He would take newspaper print that's five feet wide mm -hmm. and uh, like 50 feet long, and he would just make these like murals on his little, like he'd, he'd work on a little section of his floor in his bedroom. Yeah. Just draw, and roll it and slowly unroll it. And huh. uh, Dan's dad kind of discovered this guy. Dan's dad's like a collector, supporter, dealer of, of folk art. Um, so Dan's dad had this huge collection of scrolls and essentially it was like a way of kind of helping Alfred get like his pipe tobacco and, you know, we give him some like 50 bucks and buy him supplies and he'd make these scrolls. Uh, my dad found out about Alfred and wrote a, wrote an article about him because my dad was a journalist for the, for, he wrote about him for the local paper, the Akron Beacon Journal. And um, so anyway, like while we were teenagers, our fathers were both friendly, like on daily, almost speaking terms with this, this guy, um, Alfred because he, he he was emotionally very underdeveloped and he would call uh asking for things and what asking for help and and my dad would always uh help him um go to the art store buy him some crayons or whatever um so uh we would always come home from school to these messages on our answering machine from alfred mcmore and that uh, he would say uh you say, Jim, it's my dad's name. You say, Jim, like, I need some Diet Coke. I need some pipe tobacco. I need some crayons. If you don't, if you don't deliver these to me, you're, you're a black key, you're a D flat. That was his insult. <laughs> and like, it was just such, it was like, you know, he was much more of a character. His voice was crazier. Like, you know, you're a D flat. It was like insane screaming, basically into the answering machine. So we, we would have these collections of tapes and Dan, I would sit around and listen to like these crazy phone calls. So <laughs> when it came time to name the band, like we made this recorded. Um, so, you know, so, that, so, that, yeah. That's what we were like, we should call ourselves the Black Keys because of the Alfred. But the, you know, Dan and I, the way we came together on music is we both kind of, I was into indie rock, but also classic rock. And yeah. then through that, like, I was into like Captain Beefheart, you know, it was kind of a, to me is like this sort of, it's classic rock, it's very artsy, but it's also rooted in like blues. And Dan was into blues. So the, the, the place where we converged was, was Captain Beefheart. Um, interesting. So, and, and there, was a, there was a couple other things like, you know, that we would, we would, other artists that we initially were like, oh yeah, you're into that, you're into that, you're into that. Like, yeah, that awesome. Like a lot of outsider, self-taught musicians from Mississippi seems to be what we kind of. That was also like our mutual kind of touchstone. And from there, I'd be like, hmm. Have you ever heard T Rex? And Dan had it, and he'd be like, Have you ever heard Junior Kimbrough? And I hadn't yet. I, but I'd heard R L Burnside, and we had this kind of thing. But essentially, like, uh, Captain Beefheart and self-taught self musicians from mississippi were our kind of touchstone where we both kind of that's where our paths converge and mm -hmm. i and captain beefart his real name is don van vliet he retired from music in the early 80s uh he passed away um 2010 but for that 28 year period of time he uh he stopped performing live and he just painted he became a, a painter and a, a, a noted painter uh, who's represented you know in a gallery in new york and hmm. i I've, i actually own two of his paintings um but back to this art of the black keys is i think that the artistry 
or whatever that Dan and I have is the, the respect for art or the, pers- the, the way that we approach art. When him and I are working together, it comes from sort of an outsider perspective in a way, because we're both self-taught at our instruments. Mm. And we both really like the just aesthetic of what happens when things uh, come e- come easily, you know? Yeah. Um, when things are a little bit wrong, that's good. When things are a little bit sloppy, that's usually good. Not always, but usually. And I think that that type of like, uh, that appreciation of that type of uh, self-trained and also folky type of uh, unpretentious and I'm saying that knowing that Captain Beefheart made one of the most pretentious albums of all time. On time. Okay. So it's kind of, I do that. Um, I but that's where we, that, that's, that, that's, that's our, that's where we come from. That's where. Well, it's interesting because like, I look back, I look back at when I first heard of you guys and I was, I was totally into punk rock. I was in punk rock bands and all that. And, um, and it was interesting because the first time I heard you guys, there's definitely like, I, like around that time I was into, like like bands like Fugazi and Pavement and and um a bunch of bunch of ba- those kind of bands yeah um and and of course the punk rock scene and everything but I've always been into like Zeppelin um I actually heard T Rex like after I, I discovered you guys um I could I could definitely hear like some of the influence there um but what was interesting about you guys right away is there was there was something that it. it it's, it was like its own original sound right away because there were, you could see these little, it's like, it's like, um, and again, I can think about like as a painter, you can look at certain artists and you can see so many different, you know, areas or artists that they're pulling from. You can see it, but they, but through that, they come up with something completely original. Um, Cause you guys definitely have your own sound, but there was like, even like in your early records, there was like almost like a beastie boys thing going on with the drums like remember the old beat, of course, oh, yeah. you know, but the, the when they when they would all of a sudden do like a punk rock song or something, or there'd be, yeah, you know, there I, I could see that in some of your early stuff. Um, and then Dan's voice, um, I know this sounds weird. You've probably heard this before as well, but when I first heard you guys, I thought he was a black guy. <laughs> I was like, this is an awesome band. Like this, who who are these guys? And I see, and then I saw the picture of you guys. I'm like, who are these dudes? <laughs> like, right, yeah, back right in the day we would get that a lot. Like some people thought <laughs> our record without, without like seeing the, the cover or whatever, just hearing it, people thought it was, you know, an older recording, but that was, you know, that was intentional. That was our version of, yeah. That was what we thought was cool. Like, we, you know, we, we really love like Wu-Tang Clan and Boosty Boy, oh, Boosty yes. Boys, but like, you know, I, I, I love, you know, like Tribe Called Quest mm. Um, like just a real funky, like nasty break beat. So, like that was our initial initial plan. Was like, and this is a, you know, this was like our initial plan was like, this just I could barely play drums. But like I think I could like muster up like some sort of simple break beat, and then Dan, you you know, you play your guitar and sing, and like that was like the kind of let's just see what we come up with. So we experimented for you know a while, just trying to figure out how to make the drums sound crappy enough that. It felt yeah. realistic, uh, but yeah, you know, it's like when I was a teenager, um, you know, through like listening, to, being a fan of Beck, actually through Beck, uh, he he appeared on this uh, John Spencer Blues Explosion remix album, and uh, through so knowing that he had worked with them, I checked out the Blues Explosion, and I bought the record Orange, and. Um, I got to see them in concert a few times and it was mind blowing. It was life changing to me as a teenager to see the, see, to see back really, but also to, to see the blues explosion, to see Russell Simmons specifically to watch the drummer of the blues explosion play. Uh, he, he uses just a snare drum, a kick drum, a ride cymbal and hi hats. And uh, to this day, I think he's the best live drummer I've ever seen. I mean, he's hmm. Bonham esque in the, in the power and the authority and uh you know i like i want I, I i had this little demo that i made back in high school and i got up front to the blues explosion show like the second or third time i saw him i put it right in front of john spencer's foot and he came out <laughs> 
and in these white loafers and like green satin shirt and just like he was just so energetic he just saw the tape just smashed it kicked it off the, off the stage but you know back then it was like i had this like dream like oh if i can get this to him like maybe we get a record deal or something and for, ironically years later not that long actually it was only like five or six years later we were opening for the blues explosion in, in buffalo new york so we're backstage and wow. um we played they played there's a and uh, it was after the show there's a snowstorm and uh it was like early december 2002 and um we're waiting to kind of wait to see the snow kind of dies down before we head back to Akron. And uh, Russell Simmons is back there. And he has this trench coat, like kind of like long duster type of coat. And he pulls out like a CDR, just a burned CD and hands it to the road manager and says, I swear he said like, put it on track 77. <laughs> <laughs> or something, it was like such a high number. It was like, what the fuck? <laughs> And so she puts it on and it's uh juvenile back that back that ass up. It's just drinking Cuddy Sark listening to that. I was like, this guy's like the coolest motherfucker. Oh my gosh. That's pretty awesome. You guys, uh it's you know, it's interesting when when I look back and I think about um the time there's like a timeline because uh you know for me as an artist, as an illustrator, I started really getting working professionally around the early 2000s uh -huh. and so it's like I can look back at certain pieces of art and different jobs I did and I, I I think about the music that I was listening to and so it's 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 really awesome um you know kind of following you throughout all these years and I love the the development and the the evolution of the music but there's still that same um I guess foundation or aesthetic that's still there with you guys it was interesting i think i've heard you talk about this before but when you guys first started you like dan originally came to like record something else but it didn't work out and then you guys just started rocking out put together right it's something like that right well essentially yeah we, we we had played in high school so yeah we grew up we grew up houses from each other but but yes he he came to my house to my the, this like punk rock house i lived in um, with some other guys he came for me to record his bar band because i just bought yeah. this digital 12 track so i i had like a quote-unquote studio even though it's just like a couple shitty mics but you know he knew that i loved recording and he i guess he liked some of the shit i recorded so he came to my house and the dudes in his band didn't show up they, they thought it was a waste of time or something. Must be, yeah kicking themselves right now i mean i don't know but <laughs> i don't know but uh I know that, like, I mean, I knew Dan. I knew how good he was, and he and I and I was just trying to support him and help him. I was trying to learn my machine, really. And then he's like, "Hey, the guys didn't show up. Let's just go down there and play." And I was like, "Dude, I haven't played drums since like the last time you and I played, which was like a year and a half earlier." I was like, "I don't really play the drums." Like, yeah, you play guitar. Really, right? I play guitar, and um, he's like, "That's perfect. You just do do whatever." And like, so I. I was listening to, at the time I was delivering pizzas and listening to a lot of Safest Milk. Um, <laughs> it was a perfect job for me because I would like play music during the day, go to, I went to college at the Akron University. So I was like going to commuter school. I just was basically, I, for, I could drive around and deliver pizzas from five to 8.30 <laughs> and make like 40 bucks and uh just listen to music the whole time. And I, I, that 40 bucks a day was enough for me to pay my rent, my car insurance. It was everything. I, I looked at it so cheap back then. And um, yeah, that's crazy thinking about it. I was, I just <laughs> studied the shit out of, out of safe as milk, the first beef art record. And I didn't really understand what was happening with the drums, but I knew it was like unorthodox. Hmm. I didn't realize that they were keeping time necessarily even. So I guess my whole first approach to that record was just like, I was like, I almost played the drums like a guitar or something, I but it was that. so, yeah, it was so like kind of weird that, and that, that Dan's whole aesthetic is also just real weird. He likes a lot of weird shit. He was like, this is cool. So I, I like, I like, I recorded it and then nine 11 happened. If I remember correctly, like nine 11 happened like the next week. 
and everything was shut down. This is this is our demo, and like so, it's fall of two thousand one, and, and uh, I I mixed it for like ten days. It was like just kept twi twiddling with the little machine. There were only like four tracks, you know. But um, I gave him a burn copy of a CD, and I was like, well, "Dude, tell me what you think." And we weren't trying to start a band or anything. And he took it home, and like the next a couple hours later, he was like, "Dude, let's just make a cover for this." and uh, send it to some labels. So I called my brother, Mike, who was going to school for graphic design. And he had done a cover for another band I was in. And so I knew he knew how to do it. I was like, do make a cover. Um, so we made a little cover. We printed them out at Kinko's and mailed them to like 15 labels and got like, we got a record deal. It was the worst record deal that's probably ever been issued to a band, but we got it. Mm. And uh, I dropped out of school and we we started the band, but that's how it started. Yeah, yeah. And you guys were, um, if I remember correctly, you were working. You spent most of your time. I don't think you played any live shows, right? You recorded the record before ever did any live shows. We got like an email back from a live records who our first record label, uh, saying they put our record out if we paid for our recording. They would pay for mastering. Then we would get twelve percent of wholesale so essentially we would get 12 percent of seven dollars <laughs> wow. which w was the rate we got paid for years until we yeah ha had to kind of fix that a little bit we're still getting fucked on it but um i remember when we when we put it out the, the guy uh patrick said if you sell five thousand copies i'll i'll throw you the biggest party there'll be strippers and all the shit that record sold three hundred thousand copies man and there's there's never been a party <laughs> it's like that's why i hold a grudge against i'm like dude like yeah. you fucking liars yeah three hundred thousand. like we're that's a lot of parties man that's 60 parties um <laughs> now you guys but, like but, but we we were uh yeah so we were uh when we made the record we uh we started we just we spent all of february making it uh we work monday through friday like 9 a.m. till 3 30 p.m. and I in the winter times I would uh I, I would work in restaurants and then the summer times I would deliver pizzas and mow lawns. So I was I was working like four to ten work cooking in a restaurant. But so we'd work five days a week for like through four weeks and figure out how to make a record and you know like it was like a revelation like figure out how to put a tambourine overdub down. You know like that was big production for yeah. us back. Like oh here's an extra tambourine like fuck we're like goddamn george martin over here <laughs> <laughs> but you know the guy that started uh a lot the guy that put the record out um was helpful you know we had all these skits and not skits but samples and all kinds of shit all over the record he's like dude like this is kind of confusing let me just cut all this shit out and uh he gave us a little bit of direction and you know he would tell like maybe you could do this song a little bit better record it better <laughs> you could do it right better. He was right, you know. <laughs> I just um, like that that was a little bit of direction. He just he gave some direction. He said, yeah, you could do this a little bit better. Make it not suck so much. But Yeah. I well, I mean, that's the right kind of direction for Dan and I. You get, yeah. someone, <laughs> you get someone coming too strong with an idea. It's like, you know, like Dan and we, don't, we never rehearse, you know. Like, we just, we just did some, we we're working on a project and we just worked together on Monday and played. It was the first time that we had seen each other or played since January of last year. Yeah. Uh, we, we talk like all every day, you know what I mean? But like, we, we just hadn't seen each other for a year and, and the month and we sat down to play. And honestly, I think we sounded better on Monday than we ever had. But, um, I, that's crazy. I, so like you guys were on that big tour with your last record, which was awesome by the way. And then everything happened with this and you, did you, was your tour completely canceled of course. And you guys have just kind of been on hiatus ever since like, um, yeah, you know, we had we had a whole we had a summer tour that was supposed to happen in 2020. But obviously, no tours happening. Yeah. Rather than delay it, postpone it, we just canned it because we would be would be holding on to everyone's ticket money in a pandemic. Well, that's what know. I was gonna say is like you guys did this awesome record and you only you barely got to tour it. So, is it gonna be one of those things where you guys just like, hey, that that happened, that was an experience, 2020, whatever fuck it let's do a whole new album and when, when we can 
go oh, again. Yeah. We're gonna I, go again with a brand new, brand new uh, record. And yeah, when we tour again, it'll be a new record. Right? Okay. Um, moving you. forward, we. I mean, we. Lo- that's our favorite thing to do is make is make records. You yeah. know, and like Dan and I, you know, we've got like a together. We made like twelve or thirteen albums plus LPs. You know, uh, including Black Rock, and we made a lot of shit. And but then Dan, his he's put out solo records and produced records he's he's worked like if you add up the amount of records that yeah him and i have both worked on uh and not just like a song or two but like you know done either the whole record or majority of it like we've worked on together combined something like 85 albums it's like a a lot of records um it's amazing that's amazing man and that's and of course you've become a producer as well. So you now you've got so much under your belt. Um, I mean, you, that's that, that's what I wanted to do when I was a kid. Yeah. That's, that's why Dan came to my house because I wanted to be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know if producers the word back then, but I wanted to record bands. I wanted to yeah. make them cool. But like, I didn't know like, you know, the Circle of Fifths. I didn't know anything back then. I just knew like, oh yeah, kick drums sound good when they're big and fucking nasty. Yeah. <laughs> like. They don't sound good when they sound like a pillow, uh, that kind of thing. But since then, I have learned to like properly produce. A lot of that I learned from working with Dan, but I say equally as much, if not more, from working with Danger Mouse. You know, mm. Dan and I kind of taught ourselves a lot, but working with Danger Mouse really, really uh, what changed the game for both of us, I think. Um, hmm. um, you guys, uh, when you, you know, when you were first throughout the first early years, it's, you know, I think about what blows me away when I hear different interviews and different things you guys have done is from my perspective, I'm this artist working, listening to music while I work and everything. And you guys are one of my favorite bands. And in my mind, uh, you guys are just living the high life. And this is before brothers. This is like before uh, magic potion and, but that's that's the way it seemed. I'm like these guys are like one of the best bands ever. I never got to see you, which was it just never worked out. Um, we didn't really we didn't really tour a ton. 2005 to through 2007, we didn't tour that much then. I had really bad luck every time something always happened. But um, but anyways, it's it's crazy because then I hear like these stories about how you guys, uh, you know, would drive like you know eight to twelve hours or something and make fifty bucks. And that's and that's actually what was going on, and yeah, I mean back in the day, sure. So it's just interesting that whole perspective of uh, of you know what were you guys? <laughs> I guess what I'm what I'm wondering is what were you guys thinking? <laughs> I mean, obviously you guys have a passion for this, and what I'm wondering, I guess, is did you have like this um, this you know en- enough belief in what you were doing, obviously? to that hey this, eventually as long as we keep going as long as we keep pushing this our art's good our music's great something's going to happen because it seems like it was f- super discouraging for so many years um, well, you guys are still creating amazing stuff and i, I guess I'm, what i'm wondering too is is did that struggle uh you know during those first handful of years did that help you know the, the music at all like your creativity your writing your direction maybe Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it did. I mean, so we made this record that one I just, you know, described making and it came out in May of 2002 and uh, Patrick at Alive Records hired a mercenary booking agent to send us out to get across around the U.S. in like three weeks. Hmm. So we got him a minivan. Well, we mowed some lawns, <laughs> pocketed the cash and yeah. had like maybe three or $400 cash, no credit cards, just a debit card and uh, left to drive across the country on our first tour. No, And we had just gotten cell phones like really early Nextel, not even flip, you know, like the old school thing, yeah, but it was so expensive. We, that was just, so we were basically out there, you know, no computers, no internet. Hmm. And uh, we did this tour and, by the time we got to LA, we went from Akron to Chicago, like Denver, Boise, uh, or straight up to Vancouver and then down. But by the time we got to LA, like Fat Possum had sent out some dudes from Epitaph and 
by the time we rounded and got back and we're heading through Texas, they had called us, they got in touch with us and said for us to come to Oxford, Mississippi. And by the time we, get, so within five days of playing LA, we were in Oxford, Mississippi with like a contract in front of us with the label that we wanted to be on in the first place. Wow. Um, and we didn't sign it. We put it in our back pocket. And by the time we got to Memphis, another label was there. And then a couple of weeks later, Seymour Stein from Sire Records had flown to Cleveland and was offering us a contract. So early on, we had a lot of encouragement. There was a lot of stuff happening, you know, and uh, we had no manager back then. We had, we had just gotten a booking agent. Anyway, we, we make the second record, and there's a lot of heat. We signed with Fat Possum after deciding to just keep it indie for a while and uh, see what's up. And, yeah, you know, we toured around the whole world in 2003. Uh, we were making no money. We were so poor. Uh, we would end up in a city, barely enough money to, like, get a coffee, no cab money, just like kind of just stuck there. And then we go play the show and there'd be all these people and there'd be money coming in, but we'd walk out with like, you know, we, we, maybe if we were on a, in a show in London, you know, we did two nights at the 100 Club back then, which is like a big famous club with the Sex Pistols played one of their first shows. Hmm. We played two, headline two nights there, small little place, like 300 people. But, you know, there's like thousands of pounds. But by the time we paid for our hotel, our airfare, the, the van, the rental stuff, like we were like, got, we had like, nothing um so by the end of 2003 touring that second record we were supposed to go back to europe like in november for a whole big tour and we were taking our girlfriends with us at the time and they didn't really get along it was fucking tense and it was fucking stupid we should have not been doing that but we yeah. were both like codependent and fucking idiots uh but we did make we made a couple of these smart decisions and one of them was like we were at the Cleveland Hopkins airport about to fly to London and the, the plane's delayed. It's delayed. Then they, they cancel the flight. And Dan and I look at each other and I'm like, dude, we got to talk. I'm like, dude, let's just cancel this tour and like go make a record, another record. Uh, and he's like, yeah, we shouldn't go on this tour. We were so burned out. Like we were fucking fried. Yeah. Um, and that, I think if we would have gone on that tour, we would have broken up. So we went back and we made a record and, called Rubber Factory. And uh, we actually ended up going back to Europe. Before we made that record, we went back to Europe and did, we did 10 days in the UK, just Dan and I. It was like the most fun tour I think to this day we've ever done. We all, Dan and I and our driver, Ben, slash tour manager, Ben Corrigan, we all stayed in the same shitty hotel room, like sleeping on the floor and watching the British office. And <laughs> when we flew when we flew home, we, we made, we had made so much money because we did, we just were so cheap that we, we had each pocketed, but we each like flew home with like $9,999, each of us in our pockets. Like, cause if you had a dollar more, you had to report it or, or something. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So like that was, Funny. that was, that was the encouragement that I needed because that was like literally like a million dollars in Akron in 2003 was like 10 yeah. G's. Yeah. And, uh, so that was like th those little, th that was encouragement, encouraging. So that basically I was kind of like, we both were like, well, what the fuck else are we going to do? This is what we do. We both love music. We get, people like our music touring's tough so it's like be mindful when we do it of what we do and i mean it was hard we really fucking paid our dues and and there were lots of times when him and i were bickering like you would like passive aggressive type shit like you would with anybody you spend that much time with uh i'm much more a, a confrontational and he's he's less so it was like extra frustrating because I, I think I hated the fact he wouldn't engage and he hated the fact that I would always engage, <laughs> but either way, yeah. we were like, that's why, you know, we had all these moments and it, at one point we finally signed a major label. And then, uh, 2000, late 2005, we signed in Warner brothers. We made a record in my basement. It did. It did. Okay. That's magic potion. And danger mouse called up and said, Hey man, I want you guys to write help write and be the backing band of a Ike Turner comeback record. You know, the ultimate canceled guy, really. But, you know, mm -hmm. rock and roll inno innovator who, you know, wanted to make a record, you know, that was, I think, the idea was to reconcile his past 
so he could preserve his legacy. And so we started that and we wrote all these songs and it was slow going, but we, we got a couple done, but it was so slow. And Dan and I needed to make a record to support ourselves. So I, I remember I, um, you know, we hung out with Brian, like Coachella 2007. This is why we were working, when we were working on this thing, we were doing all the tracks in Ohio and just sending them to him in LA. We saw Brian, uh, Burton, Danger Mouse in at Coachella. And a couple of weeks later, I flew to LA just to hang out. And, um, which is a big deal. Cause I never, I never like just gone on vacation to Los Angeles really. And, uh, but it was, it was mainly to see Brian and to ask him a question. I wanted to ask him if he would produce our record and if we could take these songs and make them key songs and put the Ike thing on, uh, on hold. And I didn't even ask Dan about this before I did it. And Brian's like, sure, absolutely. So once I got Brian to agree to it, then I called Dan. I was like, hey, Brian, Brian agreed to produce a record. Let's do it. So he's like, fuck yeah. We made that record in 2007. It came out in 2008. That's called Attack and Release. And uh, yeah. That's the first tour we went on where we had a bus and it changed everything, made it a lot easier. There's still a lot of tension between Dan and I, but it wasn't like personal. It was just like exhaustion, really, and frustration, mm-hmm. but not with each other, just with like, you know, I don't know, just the process of touring and shit. And I remember being on the road and finding out I woke up to the sales results of the first week of Attack and Release and it had, it had, sold like 27 or 28,000 copies and charted the top 20, which is a big fucking deal. And, um, you know, uh, it was, it was crazy. I was like, fuck, we made it. We've made it. And then later in the year, uh, end of 2008, I find out Dan's making a solo record. I'm like, he didn't tell me. So I was like, why, (laughs) why won't you tell me? Like that made me really paranoid. I'm yeah. naturally kind of paranoid. I was like, why don't you just tell me? Like, what the fuck, dude? And then the stock market collapsed and I'd saved everything I made on that tour and it just like evaporated overnight. And I just like in this miserable kind of marriage and 2009, uh, I just wasn't sure what was going to happen. I just remember watching like, you know, conspiracy videos as being like real bummed out. And then one day Dan calls me like in May, he's like, hey, do you want to make a record with Damon Dash, like executive producing? And I was like, sure. I wasn't sure where Dan's head was even at. I don't know if his he knew, but we weren't. He was he wasn't a good communicator, and I wasn't either back then. I was but anyway, say, like, you guys like ever call just, each other and be like, "Hey, dude, do you not uh, like me anymore?" <laughs> right. I'm the like, that guy played the drums. Remember? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. Happens to, it, it happens to every band, man. It's just like yeah. You know, I remember being confused when his solo record came out and I was like, what is it? I think he's done like this is kind of, cause it kind of did come out of nowhere all of a sudden a solo thing, but um, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> that's, that's weird to hear that from your perspective that you were also confused. Um. Well, I mean, I think it's just like he wanted to make a solo record and he, his way of going about it was like, it was, he had a hard time. He, he didn't want to upset me. You know what I mean? And I, I, I took it as like, he, wanted to, to deceive me which is not the actual thing but i mean when you want... listen to it too though there's a lot of song like like it, it what's called it's called keep it <laughs> yeah yeah keep it in but i mean it's like a lot of those songs could have been black key songs you know you could have you know and we, you we had collaborated we had, we had, you know and we had kind of worked on a few of them yeah or one of one of them for sure but i can understand i guess what you're saying because you, from your perspective you're like hey man like this is kind of well you know, it's like when you when you live in someone else's pocket, like we do to each other, like it, it can be fucking exhausting. And to, to yeah. find the to find the boundaries is is <laughs> is important, you know. And to, like Dan, Dan likes to work a lot. Like I thought I liked to work a lot, but no, Dan, Dan likes to work a lot. So he's yeah. he's more, way more prolific than I am. So um, that's funny. Like, but I like well, you know, I just it, it had to get to this point where it's like, dude, you can fucking do whatever you want, but like just t- tell me what you want to do. It's like no. I think we got to that point. But anyway, we made this record and then we decided to also just go right and make another keys record. And um I was like, man, like if this thing doesn't work, who the fuck knows what's gonna happen? Like how much longer? We were about to turn 30, and I was like, how much longer are we gonna go to like get in the van or you know, mm-hmm. maybe hopefully a bus? 
and I don't know, I just, I got divorced and I just, I remember just really putting a lot of emphasis into that record and, and Dan too. And the, when it hit, when Brothers came out and it hit and like it started happening, like really on our sixth record, like getting asked to play SNL, getting asked to do this, that, and the other. Like I was like, what the fuck? It's actually happening. Yeah. And it's a lot different than a lot of people's perspective, uh, you know, a lot of other people's experience. Like, even a band like the White Stripes, like they, they their first record came out like uh, 99, and they started playing in 97 or something, but within two years, they were on MTV, you know? It, it took us a lot longer. And like the strokes, it happened like, boom. Like the EP, they were fucking big. I remember when that the fucking ep came out um fuck what song was it uh, fuck, but the strokes ep came out right before, like a six months before the record by the time the record came out they were selling 2000 seats you know but different but then there's a lot of bands who are just never they never break you know so i'm like here like oh fuck we're breaking i never thought that was really yeah. gonna happen. um and that like honestly like I don't even really like 2010 to 2021, like so much shit happened in that period of time that when I go back and think about the drama or whatever else between 2002 and 2009, the first seven years or whatever, like it's, it just feels like absolutely nothing. Just like, Oh, that, mm -hmm. it's cute that we were dysfun <laughs> that dysfunctional based on what we were doing. Like, dude, I was just I mean, no, no, I was just going to say, like, I, I I, mean, I remember when that record came out and it was a huge difference. It was a change. It was before that I would, you know, I was I was I was like almost evangelical for you guys. Like I would everywhere I'd go like and make new friends, whatever. But like you guys, you don't know who the Black Keys are. And it was like one of those things where I would recommend all the records that I had. Um, and then when the Brothers album came out, all of a sudden everybody knew who the Black Keys were. It just it was like a night and day event. Yeah, um, I was super. I mean, not that, um, not that little of me matters all that much, but I was so happy for y'all. Uh, <laughs> but well, it was. Thanks, it just, <laughs> I know it can go. It can go the other way sometimes when a band you love, like you know, when like like all you guy, sold out or whatever, like because you're in car well, it's commercials not, now. It's like, I, it's like you know the sellout <laughs> thing. Like, uh, you know. I mean, it's complicated. I, I definitely would never classify myself as a sellout. Um, no, you guys aren't sellers. I, but I, I definitely would say I'm ambitious. And like, if you're going to, once you spend seven years touring around and fucking around and figuring it out and you see other bands yeah, you, do shit that you think you can do just as well or better, like you're going to get competitive. And it's like, if you're not competitive, yeah. just with the music, like not, maybe not competitive, but if you don't want to like push yourself then nothing's going to change. But I'm just saying like, I, I know what it's like when like your favorite band, like the guy that used to beat you up in high school starts listening to your favorite band, like fucking yeah. sucks. <laughs> there was this guy who I became friends with, but he was a bully for sure. And he found out, or he saw us. Uh, he was a senior when we were freshmen. He was just such a cocksucker, you know? He, uh, <laughs> oh my God. Just such, he's like a rollerblader and like prick. But anyway, we became, ended up being a rollerblader. <laughs> But he, but sounds like, like a badass. Make, well, we would make fun of him for it, but like he was so much bigger and a senior that everyone was like, "Oh, you, know, you guys suck." Anyway, uh, that's funny. He saw us at a pavement concert and like was like, we were freshmen, and like he went to us at school a couple days later, like, "Oh, you, I don't know, you like pavement," um, and we're like, we were, we were. We were uh, we were like, I can't believe that you like payment. It makes me like the band less. And then we started making fun of him, and it was, everything was cool. Yeah. So I do think that I do think that there's that there's that weird element about like, you know, you, when you call it like a band, you're like into a band, and then people that you think are dicks like the band. Sometimes it actually creates common ground. You know, it's like I've learned this thing where years ago, where it's like I never. Most of my friends, I hate the music they listen to. I just can't, oh my God, I can't take it. Like, it's not like they're listening to the candle box or something that horrible, but they might be listening to something like real soft and acoustic or, 
not and like I don't know something I'm just not really. I mean, I'm into Nick Drake and things like that, but there's certain things I just like. I just don't have the patience for it. But of course, like I just listen to Black Sabbath all the time, like a complete meathead. <laughs> that, that's where I've transcribed. That's where I'm at right now. I don't even listen. I used to listen to Pavement and Bedhead and crazy indie rock, Math Rack. I just listen to I just listen to Black Sabbath. Sounds good. But I did. I have learned though, like. <laughs> Trying to find that common ground with people, whatever it may be, uh, is always the best policy. No, I mean, it's it's amazing to see, you know, again from from me on the outside looking in, just like watching this develop. Because so many bands, like you said, don't make it. They only, you know, there's so many. Like whatever happened to remember the band Jet? Like. I don't know what's going on with those dudes, but I remember that album came out and it was just, I just heard it all the time, nonstop. Well, and then they're just they're, gone, you know? They're really nice guys. And honestly, I, I've known those guys for a long, long time. Uh, before they were known, they played, a, they opened for us at Spaceland at our, at our record release show for Thick Freakness, which is at Spaceland in LA, April like 7th, 2003. And they were support. They were unknown. No one knew. We didn't know who they were. Yeah, they were recording that record with Dave Sardi at the time in Los Angeles. And the crazy thing is, is like our records out, you know, we don't have the push. They're on, they're on like capital. And uh, we go to Europe um, for like the third time to play Red in the Leeds. And these guys are on the cover of NMB. They're huge. They went from no one, nowhere. No one knew who they were. Yeah. Uh, to, to, and that was April to August being massive. And then I saw, we saw them a couple times, you know, and they were, you know, just rock star out um, as you would be if you were that big at 23 years old, whatever. And then we saw them a year later, 2004 at Fuji Rock. And dude, they were, they were fucking exhausted. They kind of like seemed like they hated each other. It was like oh. one year. I watched them in 18 months go from like, no one knew who they were to like, just yeah. fucking literally over it <laughs> it was like i was like whoa that's and like, crazy i mean i've watched the same thing happen with a lot of bands i mean wolf mother played like one of their first shows in yeah. london first of three in front of us in 2004 and i watched them go from that maybe it was 2005 um or six even it might have been 2006 they, but they went from that to that woman song being so big to the same thing, the whole band quit within like 18 months. The, the, the bass player and drummer like had quit. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> see, that's, what's amazing that you guys stuck it out as long as you did, you know I mean? Well, we, we, when we started like that very first session where Dan came over and the other guys didn't show up, there was another guy there. There was a third guy. My, at the time, my best friend, Gabe Fulfamar. And um, we were like, very tight and uh he was gonna help me kind of set mics up and stuff and when it turned into a session gabe played keyboards so i was like why don't you be why don't you play like bass on the keyboard so he was like in the band um early on and uh he quit in february when we were making the record after like the first week he just stopped coming and i was like dude if you don't come we're gonna kick you out and it's gonna be the end and he's like y'all suck anyway <laughs> i don't want i don't want to be in it or whatever and uh yeah i mean we're still we're still friends but uh yeah i mean the thing is if if he, if we hadn't called him on that he hadn't said that we hadn't gotten him out of the band we would never have made it to even year two would not have worked uh, i mean being in a band is like one of the toughest things you can you can be in and uh it's like a man well, yeah. I mean, it's tougher than a marriage uh, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. I mean, but, uh, you know, Dan and I have always, we've always kind of had the same aspiration, the same taste. There's different levels. Like, you know, we both get frustrated and are, are have different things going on in our personal lives that make it difficult to be around us at certain times or something, but at this point, like, you know, as of, like, in 2005, like, we took a break. I broke my shoulder, and, like, 
it was one of those things like how long do you want to take off he's like i don't know and i was like a year he said i don't know and i i wasn't sure i wasn't sure what 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 was up but i was patient i sent him a couple of emails like what's going on dude like fuck but uh you know i think he needed to get out there and do his thing and feel his independence and uh I think I was a good bandmate during that time and just was there and patient and just like, when you're ready to make music, yeah, I'm ready to do it. If you're not ready to do it, I'm ready too, but I just need a little heads up. Yeah. You know? And then I think he was a little apprehensive just because it had been a while. Like we went in the studio and we had fun and we made Let's Rock and, you know, we've been working ever since. So that's amazing. I think it's it, guys- it, I was just gonna say it's amazing that you guys came together after that much time and just, um, just right away just made an album like that. I mean, it's, it was these weren't songs that you were working on for a while and developing. You guys just got together um, after being apart for that long and just wrote that record. That's how we've done almost every record. Yeah, just like it's just, it's just mind blowing to me. I mean, it's amazing. But, like brothers, literally, just you know. I mean, that's amazing, man. Like, I, I just imagine that, oh, this is a rift I've been working on for a while, and, you know, but no. I, the, the funny thing, I mean, like, yeah, there might, sometimes there's, like, a little idea or something kicking around, but I think most of it's there's nothing. And when mm-hmm. when we do try, when we do, like, stumble on a song that doesn't kind of complete itself relatively quickly, those songs are the ones that never get finished. It's just, like it's we, just not clicking or something. We can't get a basic thing for a yeah. song in like a day. It just isn't going to happen. Okay. I see what you're saying. I mean, that was the frustration with let's with, uh, with turn blue. I think, you know, Dan was going through a divorce. He went through a lot of shit. And, uh, I should have known better. I should have been more empathetic to that. And like, stopped trying to uh, get a record done in a certain window and stuff. I wasn't thinking clearly, but it all kind of culminated with it. Well, us working on this one song that I think we all acknowledged would be the single. And um, it, we just got so burned out on it. We've never even finished it. Hmm. <laughs> it's like, it just sitting around somewhere still. The idea it's like, was like the hit probably. Yeah. That's interesting. Hey, um, um, I still want to show you some fan art. I know you said you only have an hour, so I've got to kind of hurry this up. But I wanted to tell you something, um, just share something from, you know, I, I've done one of my dream jobs was to work for Rolling Stone. Um, and I think 2008 or nine was the first one. I did a painting of Lil Wayne. Then I did Elton John and then I did a couple others. And I was starting to, you know, get a lot of stuff from them and the art director um, was becoming a friend of mine. And so I started feeling comfortable enough with him to kind of just say things or suggest things. You know, I'm always looking for that next as a freelancer. I'm like, where's that next job coming? And I, oh, yeah. I, I called him um, and I said, I said, Hey, you guys didn't review the black keys for the brothers album, the album that like, like, you know, broke through, you guys didn't review them. And El Camino's coming out. I know you guys are going to review this album. You're not going to make that mistake. You, I, am I, I mean, you know, am I right? You know, I was like trying to like hint to him. And I was like, my point is, is I really love this band. Um, you know, could, if just, just think about me. If you guys do it, just think about me because I would really love to do, this would be, you know, so much fun for me to do. Um, and the funny thing about this is every single time I've done a job for Rolling Stone, they've given me one to two days um, to do it. It's insane. Right. Um, I've, I've only one job ever. They, I, they gave me like four days or something like that. So anyways, some time passed and um, all of a sudden I get a call and it's like a, I think it's a Wednesday afternoon, late afternoon. And he says, Hey, Jason, um, we we hired someone to do a painting of the black keys and it's not good um nobody likes it we're afraid to show them um we and then he said we didn't as you know we didn't review them last year or whatever it was um we cannot review this with this artwork it's going to be a disaster what can you do and i was like okay how many of course i'm thinking in my mind i'm thinking you should call me the first 
time, you know, like, you know, I, it's like, how desperate do I have to sound here to do this one? Um, but th the funny thing was, is um, he says, oh, yeah, we need it like Friday, early Friday afternoon or something like that. And it was like late wow. Wednesday. And so I just had to kill it just to just to try to come up with something. And and the funny thing about them is there's not really any art direction. Right. Um, it's just like, just try to make it look cool. <laughs> you know? And so it was just like one of those things where um, I, I busted it out. And, and uh, you know, when I work the entire time, I'm just listening to your music while I'm doing it and just, um, you know, trying to do whatever I could. Um, and uh, to save time, I painted you guys, I think sort of like a black and white um, and then just kind of added some hints of color here and there. But but anyways, I just thought it was a uh, story that you might find interesting to hear. Oh, from yeah, that is a bit. It's funny. I don't know I who the artist was, by the way, who did the first one, but <laughs> I remember um, when that yeah when that issue came out, and then we, our cover came out a couple weeks later. I mean, that was the one of the, that was the most exciting time of my career was December, like November two thousand eleven through November two thousand twelve was a was. Or, or maybe even through December 2012 was just like fucking crazy. I mean, it was, uh, I'll never experience anything like it again in my life. And at the time I was just like, almost couldn't enjoy it because it was so stressful. But I mean, yeah, it started essentially with us getting booked at Coachella, uh, doing European press, and then going straight to New York press when that, when that issue of Rolling Stone came out and, uh, then doing SNL and I mean, fuck, it just was fucking insane. I mean, we did straight to like, uh, you know, a European tour where like members of the Rolling Stones, were like, you know, Ronnie Woods, like in our dressing room, like chilling with us and oh my we're, we're headlining Coachella and John <laughs> Fogarty's hanging out. And then we're like, we're playing Central Park and Neil Young's performing and we're, he's, you know, making fun of us to our face, but in a fun way, in a funny <laughs> way. <laughs> and I mean, it's just like, boom, boom, boom. And, then, and it, it all kind of culminated with us like performing with the Rolling Stones in New Jersey at their 50th anniversary. It was just, it was like thing after thing, after thing, after thing. Um, but yeah, that, it kind of all started with that, that Rolling Stone review. Awesome. Well, Hey, I feel honored to have played a small little part there, but it was, uh, it was, dude, you have no idea how like every, I'm, I'm still the same way. Anytime I do something for a big magazine, I can't wait to go see like it on the shelf, you know, and Rolling yeah. Stone is still one of those magazines that when I get to do something for them, it's the same thing. So it made it, it made it way extra cool that it was one of my favorite bands. So, well, I've always been a fan of Rolling Stone. It's like, uh, it's the, by far the best and may, may, well, maybe the only mainstream music magazine in america but i love jan and i love gus yeah. and the, jan's uh two oldest sons are, are close friends of mine we became friends since you know being in the magazine and everything but i i i really think gus and theo are two of the you know most stand-up dudes i know honestly that's awesome i had um my my uh the first job I did for them was the Lil Wayne painting. And I was so excited. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe it that they finally called me for a job. And then, um, and he told me, Hey, this is one of our favorite illustrations we've had in a long time. And he was the art director told me that. And I'm just like, yes, you know, it's the best feeling ever. But then like, I'm not even joking, not even an hour later, he called me and he said, um, really sorry to say this, but Lil Wayne is, is uh, he's not getting out of jail. Um, and something with the producer is like, we're, we're not allowed to review this record now. So um, you, we, you can still share the art and say that you worked for Rolling Stone, but it's not going to be published in the, Oh my God! and then he goes, but we have another one for you. And I was like, or no, he goes, you know, but I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll call you soon. You know, like if, if something else yeah. comes up, so I'm thinking, yeah, right. That was my one chance and it's over. So it was like a day or two later, I got called to do the Elton John one. And um, the art director said, Hey, just so you know, everyone loved the last one you did just bring that same aesthetic and everything. Um, but I got to tell you, uh, Jan is like super, super tight with Elton John and 
you got to be really, really careful with this one. It can't be, you know, it's, it's got to be really straight, like not um, silly. You can't like, you know, he like gave me all these, you know, uh, kind of just like a list of things. And he basically said, if he doesn't like it, you probably won't be working with us ever again. <laughs> that fair was like, the, yeah, that was the instruction. <laughs> hey, I mean, yeah, that's, fair the, enough. That's, the, that's the review section. It's editorial to do it. You know, the boss yeah. is the boss. It's not, and so it's not, I just, uh, it's not news. It's, it's, Oh it's yeah. Big... No. So I just, uh, you know, I was so nervous. I kept like sending him like sketches and process while I was working on it. Just to, is this okay? How about this? How about if I, if I draw this or, you know, <laughs> so it was like super nerve wracking. Um, anyways, thank you so much, man. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, hang out and just chat a little bit. And, uh, it's awesome just hearing your, your, uh, stories and just the, you know, I appreciate your honesty with things. Like you're just pretty much open about everything. And it's really cool to hear that. It's awesome. Yeah, it's probably a personality defect, but uh, <laughs> I, <it's... laughs> I don't think it's a defect, man. It's really <laughs> it's it's refreshing because I mean, there's so many times you talk to people, and uh, and I'm not talking about being, but just in general, and it's just a bunch of bullshit. So I I really I think it's awesome that you're just straight up about stuff. Yeah, you know, I mean, I will say I want to end it with this: like all the drama and the stress, the crazy years of success. I mean there isn't a single day that, that I wake up and I'm not like, I'm like, what the fuck happened? How, <laughs> like, I just can't believe it all kind of worked out. Uh, you know, and when people ask me for advice, like, how do you do it? Do you, who do you, what engineer, what producer? I, I, and ultimately for me, it's like, it all comes down to who you choose to start a band with. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and for, for me and Dan, it was like thrown in our laps. Our brothers were really good friends and they encouraged us to get together and play a couple of times in high school. And it was so, there's so much, like, there's so much luck. Um, and Alfred McMore used to always say his, his expression when he was like, what he would say when he was happy, when he would get his pipe tobacco from my dad or Dan's dad, he would say, I got, I got so much luck in my head. And I, honestly, I think that that, you know, that really is it. I think that there's a lot of luck, a lot of fate or something. And uh, I think too, too often musicians chalk it up to talent and something internal, but there's something else out there. Uh, and whether it's just having met the right person, but knowing to like be persistent, to work through the trouble, the trouble, to, to work on a relationship so that it's productive and functional. I mean, these are all things that like, I'll take as much credit for that as I will for talent. And as I will let happen for luck, there's so many things in it, but um, I think a lot more bands would be together still if they didn't think it was the talent, you know, because clearly Dan's talented. I think I'm talented, but our relationship and our ability to get together and the fact that that even was allowed to happen, those are X factors that you can't really quantify. Um, and, you know, you read the history, through the history of rock and roll, whether it's Joe Strummer or Mick Jones or Paul McCartney, John Lennon, these people who fall out with each other, uh, you know, uh, you have to look back to Keith Richards and Mick Jagger and be like that. That's what happens when you get along. You can you it can go forever, you know. Um, but yeah, I think sure, that, that, that that's it. Like honestly, that, that's every time you hear you know like you know working through that shit. I think that that's one thing that really. I saw that there's a quote. I thought Adam Levine was getting some bullshit because he was saying there's no more bands left, and people were making fun of him because his band is like just like a pop machine. <laughs> whatever else it is i'm not gonna get into it but uh you know there aren't there aren't a ton of bands that get played on the radio there's tons of bands yeah. but it's i think that like uh that's unfortunate that there isn't more of a focus on music because the thing about music that's always drawn me to, into it is this is that i can't really sing you know what i mean i mean i can sing twinkle twinkle little star to my kid yeah but i can't sing and uh but yet i i i i'm a musician you know what i mean 
um, all too often people who can't sing and are musicians are relegated to have a lesser role, you know, uh, in, in the music industry or within making music. Uh, but the thing about music is it's the, it's really, as far as I can think of, it's the only kind of art form that you can just pick up with your friend, create from nothing, perform, and totally collaborate the whole time. I mean, yeah. I mean, like maybe you could say like some forms of acting and stuff, but there's, it's an inclusive, it's a collaborative thing being in a band. Uh, and uh, honestly, it, it's taught me to, to know when to stand up for myself. It's taught me to know when to shut the fuck up. It's taught me a lot, you know? And that, that's why we call, I mean, being in a band, you know, you end up with like a, a brotherly or sisterly relationship with the people you're in the band with. And that's why we called the record brothers. Cause also man, we went through this hardship, but we came back and we, we had that type of commitment with each other. And I think, you know, I think it would be fun if like, uh, more bands are recognized because there's a ton of them. They just don't get fucking any recognition. So, yeah. Anyway, that's it, man. Thanks. It's been <laughs> good talking to you. Yeah. Thanks, man. I really do appreciate it so much. Uh, thanks for taking the time. And uh, to everyone else, thank you for uh, checking it out and supporting the podcast. And uh, have a good night, Patrick. Thanks so much. All right, man. You it. too. All right. All take right, care, man. man. Bye. All right. Bye. You want answers? truth.